So I know a few of us just joining us today who haven't been with us through chapters 1 through 4, but as we've been going through Romans, we've addressed all the basics. Uh, Mark, a few weeks ago, cleared up the idea of just what's happening, why Paul is so exhaustive in this. He's not talking to a congregation that he's already had a ton of interaction with, so he's giving them one of the fullest articulations of the gospel that appears in the New Testament. And so it, that's great. We get the, one of the most articulate forms of expression about the good news, about what Jesus has done. That starts, of course, then, in always contrast. Paul wants us to know God and his righteous wrath. He wants us to know that man is without excuse, that none are righteous, and that the law, as he keeps his night, we see him reiterate over and over in this section of Romans, chapter after chapter. He's making sure we understand the law doesn't save, particularly to the Jewish audience, but we can still today walk and treat things as if the law and keeping it is what's getting us into heaven or getting us into a good relationship with God. And he's stressing again and again that salvation is by faith. Salvation is by faith in Christ alone. And to the end of chapter 3, he lifts up what Christ has done. That was the first time he kind of landed the plane on the gospel and really emphasized what's happening through what Christ has done. Now, last week we looked at chapter 4 as he then went all the way back 4,000 years to the biblical but also very historical man of Abraham, calling him the father of all who believe. Something interesting to think about as we think how we're tied to our father, our forefather, Abraham. And we talked last week about what that meant to us, to me and you. That as just with Abraham, he counts Abraham's faith as righteousness. Before he was circumcised, before he was really moving, before he was even changed from his name Abraham to Abraham. And then also then, as he ended last week, as we began to wrap up chapter 4, there's the great verses that it ends on. It says, but the words that was counted to him, meaning Abraham, were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It, was, it will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead, Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Amen? Amen. Amen. We need saving faith like Abraham's, a faith that is apart from works, yet also marked then by works. A faith that is apart from the law and actually in some ways apart from sight. Again, it's not by sight, it's by faith. And therefore, we are, as I said, regarded or counted, reckoned as righteous, as a matter of grace. And so what is faith? We looked, looked at it last week. When we look at faith, we get to the idea of faith or belief, trust, confidence. And with that then, a marked fidelity or faithfulness that comes out of a natural and genuine faith. And so we'll get into a little more about faith this week, but before we dive in, I was thinking this week, well, I was actually on a little vacation with my wife, so I was only kind of seeing news headlines on a TV screen uh, in the hotel in the morning when we'd be eating breakfast. So my understanding of what's going on in the world is a little limited. I had some California sunshine that was distracting me. Now I have some peeling on the top of my head from the sunshine. But, but I did notice some negotiations hit a hiccup with North Korea last week. That there is still then looming in so many people's minds the, uh, the perceived and possible reality of nuclear threat still involved in the world. And that actually got me thinking about when I was a kid. It was a little different. I grew up in the Cold War. Now I was post-Vietnam. It was kind of Carter to Reagan era. It was mostly the 80s that I was old enough to even really understand anything of what that meant. And even then, as a 7-year-old to a you know, 12-year-old, it's limited. And in the 80s, there was no real war that I was aware of, right? This was post-Cuban Missile Crisis. I mean, technically, the Cold War was from about 46 to 91, depending on how you reckon it. But my, to my 10-year-old brain in the 80s, all I ever knew was it was this term and this idea, but there was actually little real visible conflict to engage my senses. At the same time, even as a kid, did I know peace? Did I really know peace? And the answer is no, because there was always, at least to my seven to ten year old brain, this idea that we were on the precipice of conflict. There may, might not be imminent violence, there might not be imminent missiles, but it was edge of the sea, 
get ready to duck and cover because that'll work. Right? Nukes were at the ready. Like certain nebulous things like keys and buttons could be pushed at any moment and a possible mutually assured destruction could happen. Any minute. Any minute, man could just decide it was time to have turn that cold war into a hot war. Or, depending on the movies I watched as a kid, an artificial intelligence might just do it for us, right? War games, Terminator. Always then, whether even, even in the films I would go see as a kid and a young man, like this looming, possible, cold to hot, War was always there. It wasn't real peace, even though my life, to be totally honest, thank everybody, including my mom who's here today, right? It was fairly peaceful in actual daily living, but it wasn't really that I was living in a place that was truly at peace. Right? I had this illusion of peace in my backyard in Kent. Right? So I didn't think about it all that often. You know, I'm sort of, sort of fenced off from the realities in one way. But as a kid, so I had a swing set, I had a sandbox, I had distractions, but did I have real peace? No, this world that I was in was not a peace and a part of me at any given time, even if it was just vaguely in the periphery while I'm playing in the treehouse. Not my real backyard, by the way, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> we were locked in this war, and it seems in many people's minds that it was simply only a matter of time before there would be mutually assured destruction. To go back even further, thought about a story I then heard as a kid about a war that I knew nothing about. Anybody heard about the, the Christmas truce of 1914? Several of you. It's often celebrated as a, as a symbolic moment of peace in an otherwise devastatingly violent war, World War I. We, we like to believe that for just one day, all across the front, men from both sides emerged from the trenches and met in no man's land to exchange gifts and play football. But first-hand testimonies honestly get us a little closer to what really happened. And for those who have you know, seen the, the Hallmark movie or other things, I don't, I don't want to rain on your parade, but I'd rather rain on it at the beginning so we can end on something in the message where there's sunshine. The motivations for this were pretty complex. They weren't and everything is this magical moment. No, it was one of several very practical times. It wasn't the first time a truce took place, but it actually the truce of 1914 was one of the last. Unofficial truces or reciprocal periods of quiet time. Sounds like the kindergartners. <laughs> right? Soldiers would tacitly agree not to shoot at each other, so between battles or out of boredom, informal truces were agreed upon as an opportunity to recover the wounded soldiers, also to shore up the damaged trenches, and in many ways, for the last of the professional soldiers, it was almost this idea of war having an etiquette to it. High command actually didn't like this at all, so they regarded it as treason in some cases, and said that everyone should be vigilant against this kind of interaction and contact. Now, along the Western Front, a scattered series of small-scale ceasefires did happen between British and German forces in 1914. The damp weather gave way to a cold and festive front and it was apparently what happened is men began to sing carols, and there was actually almost a carol sing-off. And then the next morning, there was a time that people came out of the trenches and exchanged gifts and even took photos. But it was it was importantly, it was a chance to leave the damp of the trenches and tend to the dead that were still out there in no man's land. There was there was no single organized football match, but there were some small-scale kickabouts. But here's the reality. It was far from a mass event. Where it didn't occur, December 25th, 1914 was a day of war like any other along many places in the front. Bloody battles took place. And those that dared come above the parapet were met not with gifts but gunfire. Belgian, Indian, and French troops who actually witnessed some of the episodes of British and German fraternization were at best puzzled and many actually very angry that the British troops were being friendly toward the Germans. As the war continued, battle, the battlefield actually changed the character more and more. Fraternization became even less likely. Small truces like 1914 never happened again. But despite, the, but despite the best efforts of the authorities, the story was out there, and of course, in the media, for certain reasons, it was popularized to maybe make things feel good. But let's ask ourselves the reality. Is it a happy story? 
Is it a happy story? That's the big question, right? Let's pretend we have peace today, and I will shoot you tomorrow. Right? Well, while, mean, while some of our fellows are killing each other down the line, let's pretend it's not happening and be nice to each other for a morning. Right? The tragedy here is that the peace was not real and the peace did not last. It didn't last. Let me skip ahead, Lila. I think the notes are a little bit off. But is this false, fleeting peace really a happy story? We have to ask ourselves that. The next day, it was shown to be a sham. And I don't think there's any real lasting peace if today I'm nice to you and then tomorrow I brutalize you. That's not real. And that's what I want us to think about. Most people in the world live our lives, or we want to live our lives, a little bit like 10-year-old James. I don't want to pull down a veneer over the reality of war and just play with toys. And sometimes we like to do that in our relationship with God, right? And God and me, we're good. Look, he's not raining wrath down on me like Sodom and Gomorrah. Everything must be okay. Meanwhile, what we do is we push the button and send missiles of sin right up into his face like an unholy offensive. And, our, and it is our hatred of God and his design for us. And some people don't even act like they're ignorant of it. For some, it's almost like a theological cold war. Oh, you say God has something against me? Well, I've got this and this against your concept of God. A good God wouldn't do this. A good God wouldn't do this. We stockpile our defenses thinking they'll have any effect when the reality is judgment day is coming. Paul tells us that in earlier chapters, a button will be pushed. Our theological offenses against God, they won't even leave the silos. Right? We can stockpile all our issues with the God of the Bible, but when it comes to the day the button is pushed, they're getting nowhere. Our, and our missiles of sin, our declarations of war, they won't even have any impact on God's kingdom except to assure our own destruction. It's not mutual. His judgment against us will be an eternal radiation and devastation that's never quenched, Scripture says. Apart from the work of Jesus Christ, we're like guys celebrating Christmas in the trenches. It seems peaceful today. We raise a glass. Isn't it nice? Tomorrow, apart from the saving grace of a loving Savior, we die in agony forever. That's delusion. And why is this important? All of this is important because we're going to encounter five little words. Words we could count on our fingers. In verse 1 of chapter 5, we have peace with God. And we really need to understand what that means. Because, if I, I, hey, I woke up today, house was quiet, some birds were singing outside, it was sun shining, no one tried to kill me as I ate my breakfast, no one stopped me at checkpoints and asked for my identification on the way to church, I'm allowed to gather in this church, it was pretty peaceful. So I could hear, when I read verse 1, I have peace with God, and just think, yes, I have peace with God. No, when I think of peace with God, it means that there's a cessation of hostilities of what would have been the most devastating crisis I or the world could ever have faced. And, there wasn't, and then again, there wasn't mutually assured, but singularly assured destruction of me and the entire human race that's only been averted by this singular and unique Peace, true peace, eternal peace that God has brought for all those who put their faith and their trust and their heart into it. I cannot hear those five words as some idea of soft tranquility. It is a grace that is truly amazing and a peace that should astound more than any other time you hear the word. And that's how I want to begin verse one. We should be shaken when we hear that phrase. Paul begins, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character. Character produces hope. 
And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. One will scarcely die for a righteous person. No, perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we've now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were still enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, now that we're reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who, whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one that was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift of, by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many tres trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. As peace with God. That should never get old to hear. I should never feel less than substantive. And the question today, I want us to look at five ways that what, as we ask ourselves, what does real peace look like? Because again, I can have a great morning with a cup of coffee and it can be tranquil. We can have a cessation of hostilities and be in a fairly well-protected and peaceful nation. We can have the freedom to worship. We can feel like there's peace, but you know what? I'm not getting any younger. This body is starting to have aches and pains and back problems. It only could survive eight roller coasters without a break on Friday. <laughs> right? My own body is at war with me. In one way, it's starting to slowly fade. What is real, true peace of mind? Soul, heart. Let's work backwards today. I'll start just look at verse 20, 21. This should be familiar because we've been talking about it for the last like a gazillion weeks of Romans here, right? <laughs> the law came to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Paul's been making this point since early in Romans about the law. So he gives us, so what he does, you notice here, he gives us more of the gospel, a bigger picture, and then he cycles back to make his point about the law he's been making all along. The law increased the trespass. Law doesn't save people. Law actually adds combination. He's articulating the reality of what the law did. Moses came in, gave us those Ten Commandments that we talked about in the Catechism. What did it prove? That we could all be good people who keep things perfectly? Nope, just more condemnation. See, you can't do it. The more God codifies and articulates it, the more it shows how incapable we are. It makes the necessity of grace all the more clear, the necessity of God's unmerited favor all the more necessary. So what does real peace look, look like? God's unmerited favor. And we see that in a, in a few different ways as we begin to encapsulate the concept. It means his regard and his love. And if I say, if I say my wife has my favor, what does that mean? Right? It means she 
usually she has, well, she has my attention. She has acts of demonstrative love and affection. She has interaction. She has relationship. It'd be the same as a king. A little bit different, but when you, when you say we have the king's favor or the king's regard, that means the king regards you as an ally. He usually then bestows kingdom gifts upon you. Right? We have, in that way, grace encapsulates an idea of having the regard of our King Jesus, the love of our King Jesus, the unmerited favor, and all of the things that that trickles into. 21, so as sin reigned in death, grace might also reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Eternal life through Jesus Christ, eternal peace. I, I don't just get to have a moment of peace or a day of peace or a year of peace or a nation that for a season isn't at war somewhere. I get eternal peace. Eternal peace because I have been told by the God of the universe that in Jesus Christ, I will never die, although this body will fade and turn to dust. There's something that God has grabbed and calls imperishable and will give a new body. Jesus triumphed over death when he rose from the grave, so ultimately I should be shedding that fear of the final day here. I'm not, not going to pretend that we all don't, myself included, wrestle with the idea of wasting away in that final day. But God has removed that ultimate fear out of the foundation of peace, even if the ideas and concerns sometimes still cause me some anxiety. That's what the whole section above is about. It's contrasting Adam and Christ. One man to one man. Verse 12, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. All right, 12 to 20 deals with this idea. So let's talk about death. Everybody's favorite subject. Right? As a pastor, I've, I've been to my share of funerals. And I always hesitate a little bit. I see it on TV shows where they have the funerals, or I'll, I'll see it at funerals where I'm not presiding. And I, 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 I don't like it when someone tries to comfort. And they're like, well, I've said that to somebody. No, 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 James isn't mad at you. James has actually said it too. When people try to say death is natural, because the answer is yes and no. At the world in which we presently find ourselves, is death natural? Yes. Humanity prior to the first sin? No. Humanity in the kingdom to come? No. For those doing math, that's two no's to one yes. Christians designated for the kingdom to come? Yes and no. Yes to body, this one. But no to spirit will be given that new, new body, immortal, imperishable, incorruptible. It's a triumph over what Paul here equates literally as a contagion, right? What does he say? So death spread to all men because all sinned. Death spread like a plague, like a contagion. That's the flavor of the language that he's bringing. And it's unnatural. It's an infection. The black plague is, well, you know, I think we consider that almost like death itself moving through humanity centuries ago. The truth of Scripture is that death was the re is the result of spiritual plague. When we look at the way sin is described here, it's plague. And, and this actually gets to a little part that we struggle with. In fact, it was interesting there in the catechism video, even talking about idolatry, we don't, we don't get to have God be and operate as we would like. That, that's idolatry. There's, sometimes I run into things in Scripture where God seems to be saying things work in a way that chafes at my automatic way of thinking but this is one of those places where scripture gets to a place we don't like the idea that sin is communicable death reigned from adam to moses many died through one man's trespass because of one man's trespass death reigned that doesn't seem fair but that's the concept actually of original sin it's tough to swallow that original sin is peppered throughout your bible in concept just a simple phrase that is used to articulate it. The original sin is the idea that Adam's sin has resulted not only in James, in our having a sin nature, but also in our incurring guilt for, for, before God. 
for which we deserve punishment. Psalm 51 says we're conceived in original sin. A sin, a sin nature so wicked, Jeremiah says, the human heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. There's that contagion idea again. Not only was Adam found guilty because he sinned, his guilt and his punishment belong to us as well, as we see in Romans 5. And there's two reasons why Adam's guilt also belongs to us, which is hard for us to wrestle with. First, the human race was within Adam when he sinned. In seed form. This is similar. Those of you who remember when we walked through Hebrews, and the author teaches that Levi, who was a descendant of Abraham, said, Levi paid tithes to, to Melchizedek. Like, well, Levi was born hundreds of years later. That event, Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. Levi's just his offspring way later. But the idea is, Levi paid tithes to Melchizedek because he was in Abraham. So original tithing is dealt with there. Right? The idea of being connected as the offspring or seed of, and thus also in a lineage way, under that condemnation is the way it works itself out here. Also, Adam, as it articulates being the first man, Adam served as our representative. And so when he sinned, we were found guilty as well. You're like, well, I didn't vote for him. Too bad. Here it is in Romans. Sin came into the world through one man, and death spread to all men because all sinned. Now, some of you will stop right there and say, wait, 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 see? It says, death spread to all men because all sinned. So it's, it's because I sin then that I get the condemnation. Now, make no mistake. We double down on our own sins, no question. But that inclination and bent to sin has been in me since birth. First time, first time one of us pushed our sister down. First time we lied to mom and dad. The first time we threw a tantrum. Or last week when we threw a tantrum. Right, that nature has been in us since the first man and woman sinned and the world fell under a curse. And that's, Paul makes this very clear through one man, death. Many died through one man's trespass. Judgment followed one trespass, which brought condemnation. Death reigned because of that trespass. One trespass led to condemnation for all men. For as the one man's disobedience, the many, hear that, for as the, by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So we don't like the idea that we are under this condemnation because of lineage. Our forefathers or our father's sins. That's not on us. Yes, it is. Adam brought sin and death. We inherited a sin nature. Sinful from the womb, David says. Sinful from birth. We'll see that more. Doomed because of the first man. Now, why is this important? Because Paul is making a one-to-one -one correlation here that is beautiful even while I chafe at it. Adam, being the first man, served as our representative. Adam, it says, who was a type of the one who was to come. He's talking about Christ. It's the contrast between Adam and Christ. One and one. Christ likewise serves as representative to all who believe. That's the one-to-one -one correlation that we see. Adam was given authority over all creation. So if Jesus has been given authority over all creation, only Adam was tempted and failed. Jesus was tempted and passed the test. In Adam, he caused all mankind to be infected with sin. Jesus causes all in him to be healed from sin and death. Right? Instead of disobedience to God that leads to death, in Jesus, one, the one correlation, we have obedience to God that leads to life. And while Adam basically ceded authority to Satan, through the cross, Jesus conquered Satan's sin and death and took it back. Amen. Right? Through our representative Adam, we get condemnation. Through our representative Christ, we get justification. Through our representative Adam, we get death. Through our representative Christ, we get life. Through our Adam, we inherited a sin nature, and through Christ, we become co-heirs. That's a different inheritance in righteousness. Part of this comes down ultimately to how we see the world and humanity and the severity of sin. I think it comes down to Old Yeller or Cujo. Right? Because those of you who may know one or both of those stories, both get rabies. And in Old Yeller, he's got a little shaving cream around his snout. He looks a little meaner. He's got the bark face. We're like, oh, that's so sad. 
He saved the boy and the different things, and now he's got to be put down. It's a bummer. Cujo, he's so savage, he just is like, that dog needs to go. <laughs> like, nobody's really mourning Cujo at the end of Cujo. That dog needs to be put down hard. And now when we're talking about inherited sin nature, we're talking about mommy and daddy Cujos getting together and having baby Cujos called James. <laughs> right? Those were never good. Like the offspring are never good. They're born like those dogs in Resident Evil, right? They're just, they're, they're, that's it's just like, now we're a whole society of Cujos. And some of you are like, well, I still have trouble thinking that ill about dogs. Then make it rats. Make it that animal that repulses you that you just wish was, was off the face of the earth now. Right? Our view of God's wrath and the view of our condition will vary with our view of ourselves and our sin. In our sin, Paul describes a rabid, infected, and volitional animals that need to be put down. That should have been put down, wiped out, eradicated. That comes back to that contagion idea. And then that's the really good news of the gospel. That's the severity I need that makes the gospel so sweet that in the one Adam who brought sin and death... You were all infected, but through the one Jesus who brings sinners from death, you're redeemed. That's healing. That's the third point, right? Healing from the effects, the lethal effects of sin. And that's what Jesus did on the cross. He was, metaf he was metaphorically mauled by the Cujos in that day. But the truth of the gospel is that Jesus came, let the Cujos of the world metaphorically maul him to death, and then three days later got up out of the grave and healed her rabies. And went from bloody savage coats to being beautiful creatures. Cured, no more death, no more condemnation, new heart, new nature. We can be frustrated at, by the way, the representative from Adam peace works in God's economy. Or we can see the beauty of what it looks like to be cured from that inherited nature and rejoice, right? Because that's, that's where he goes in this chapter, verse 8. We keep moving backwards, back up into the section before. We're no longer sinners, but saints. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the grand encouragement. While we were weak, right? That's, again, the contagion. I'm ill. I'm ailing. Scripture goes beyond even saying I'm dying. It's like I'm spiritually dead. God shows his love for us while we were still sinners. Verse 10, for while we were still enemies, there's that Cold War concept. While we were enemies, we were reconciled. Now much more, we're, we're now we're reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. One word I want us to focus on there that I think a lot of times today, a segment of Christi Christianity gets wrong while we were still sinners, Christ yet died for us. There's a couple slides. One more slide forward. Let's show the word on us. There we go. Were. What tense is that? It's past tense. Question. Don't answer it. Are you a sinner? Let's go to verse 10 first. Verse 10 says, while we were enemies. There's past tense. We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Let me ask you another question. If you're a Christian, are you an enemy of God? No. It says you were. That's past tense. By the same token, then, what should I be thinking when I'm asked the question, am I a sinner? The answer, conceptually, is no. And I wish Christians would stop saying some confusing phrases, like I'm, I'm a sinner saved by grace, because how many times post-conversion do we see anybody refer to those in Jesus Christ as being sinners. I've only found one in the New Testament. It's Paul at one point when he's making a point that among sinners he was the chief or he is the worst. And he uses present tense. That's true. But in fact, what we see is those who are saved are called saints. They're called children. They're called co-heirs. There's so many other words that aren't sinners that are used that we should be using. Now, let's be clear. Do I still sin? Do we all still sin? That's true. But if someone, anyone in this room, was to go out next weekend, have a few too many drinks and get drunk, does that mean they're an alcoholic? No. If someone got offered illegal drugs and fell into sin and had a really bad night, does that mean they're a coke addict? No. Right? It's a question of labels and identity. We can humbly confess that we still sin. 
That doesn't mean we wear the identity label of sinner. I don't wear the scarlet S anymore. It's a white one that stands for saint. If we're in Christ, we're already declared otherwise, and we should stop needlessly compromising our new identity in him by using the identity language. Some of us need to stop comporting ourselves like sheepish sinners, right? That's number four. We should, by these verses, have a confidence in both our standing and our ability to walk away from sin. Right? This should have two impacts. It should make me confident. Right? I'm, Christians should be confident and assured. Not like a bland little house pet. Oh, it's a sinner. Thank you, Jesus. God says rejoice. That's a boldness. Paul was not a timid, yeah, he kind of saved me. I'm so glad he knocked me off that donkey on the way to Damascus. No, he was bold in his faith. He was excited and certain, and it was evident on his face. His chin was up. His shoulders were straight. He was not slumped as someone being saved. And number two, what it should also do is it should make us people who battle sin within our hearts. Right? No longer, I can't use I'm a sinner saved by grace as a mumbly kind of excuse to keep on in unrepentant little patterns. That I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I can't. No. God says grace is something and, not, and grace filled, not just grace filled. I, I like grace powered. I'm not grace infused. I'm not being grace transformed. That should make me excited and confident to a way where sin and temptation come and I no longer have to trace sin. And, uh, I was a sinner again. See, saved by grace. I don't need to keep proving that every day. We'll get into that next week. Grace doesn't need to abound because of extra sin. And that's the kind of hope and excitement that we see then in verses 2 through 5. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And then he gives us that great end run, which we close with, right? We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. Amen? Amen. Right? A lot of us get it backwards. We want it easy, and we want it backward. And don't feel any more convicted than your pastor. Part of me wants him to love it to be this way. Like, oh, I, I see you're talking about that hope in Christ. I would love that kind of hope. God, it's like, all right, all right, God, give me that hope, and I'll be a man of better character. And God says, my son, character produces that hope. Oh, really? Well, well then God, give me, give me good character so I can last the long haul. And God says, to some of us, my daughter, that character comes from endurance. Ah, oh, that character comes through being in it for the long haul. And I go into it, God, give me endurance then so I, can, so I can endure suffering. And God says to us, my child, endurance is forged through that suffering. That's literally the last thing some of us want to hear, right? It's like, well, okay, well, I guess after the suffering, then I'll rejoice in these things. God says, no, rejoice into these things. Really? That's not an easy word. I'm not going to preach this and put it in the So go do it. It's easy. No worries. No, it isn't. It's really hard to go out and walk through our week and, and find a hope that isn't based on our feelings. I know hope comes from my character being built. And character comes through endurance and lasting the long haul. And endurance is forged by suffering, man. And thus I rejoice. Now, usually for many of us, we, we want to just remain in an immature place where, you know what, I'll just rejoice between the times of suffering. I'll do the bare minimum that's required on my character. I'll treat my Christian walk like a short, occasionally motivated little sprint instead of an endurance run. And then we look up at God and wonder why we don't have more hope. Like, while we were weak, there's another past tense, while we were weak at the right time, Christ died for us. That's a call towards strength, isn't it? Those with saving faith will seek to strengthen their faith and hope in the grace that God has given. 
And we can do that because our hope is on a certain future secured in Christ. It may not be a felt present. That's where we have to war against what remains of the, could they say, the old man in Scripture. But it's an assurance of future glory. Through him, it says in verse 2, we've obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. That's my question and my hope and my prayer for all of you today. Do you have saving faith? I walked through this, we walked through this last week, and I just want us to consider it again as we move toward a season of Lent, where maybe some of us do need to carve out some special time to walk between now and Easter and really seek God and a chance where he can grow us out of a place of stagnance into a more lively and active faith. And some of you are like, well, I don't, I don't have hope because I'm not sure about my faith. These 12 questions we'll post on the, on the website and Facebook this week because they're really helpful. And the goal isn't that all of them are at play now and you feel confident that all of them are doing awesome. It's not all 12 of these are awesome. It's do I see any of this happening? And I, I changed them from use to eyes so that I could say them with you because I need to look at them too, right? Do I enjoy having fellowship with Christ who has redeemed people? Would people, would people say, I walk in the light? Or would they say, I walk in the darkness? Do I admit and confess my sin? Now there's something to ponder and examine over the last year or season of life. Am I obedient to God's word? Does my life indicate I love God rather than the world? Is my life characterized by doing what is right? That comes to even beginning learning to love the laws like we talked about in regard to the commandments earlier. Do I seek to maintain a pure, do I seek, do you say, does it say do I perfectly do it? It says do I seek to maintain a pure life? Do I see a decreasing pattern of sin in my life? Do I demonstrate love for other Christians? Do I actually walk the walk or am I just talking? Right, do I maintain a clear conscience? Do I experience any victories in my Christian walk? If it, as we begin to be able to answer these yeses, it means we can see the fruit of the Holy Spirit working in our hearts, that new heart God's given us, beginning to flourish, beginning to blossom, beginning to grow. Again, these aren't the things that are saving us, but they are assurances that God's healing is at work in us. And we need to focus on that. We need to recognize the war that we would have apart from Christ and see the fruit of the peace he is bringing to fruition in our hearts. Because my prayer is that nobody here, nobody here would remain living somewhere between either sort of a myopic backyard of indifference to growth and flourishing in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, or that nobody would be in a bitter trench of effectively spiritual cold war against a God with which Guys, we cannot win unless we simply submit ourselves to the win and victory of Jesus Christ who has then won it for us. Good news is our spiritual cold war can be over today. Good news is God's Holy Spirit may already be at work in your heart today. Today may be the day someone here responds for the first time and saying, I have saving faith in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Amen. My friends, peace with God is possible, and it's a big deal. It should never cease to be a big deal. It should be an astonishment to those who have it, and a, I would pray a miraculous breakthrough to those who don't yet. There's nothing in our life that's bigger than that, no matter how it feels. And some of us may want to revisit doubting hearts. Some of us may want to take part in Lent this season so we can test ourselves and examine our faith and hopefully come out of the other end with a brand new joy. What does pure, real peace look like? It looks like salvation by faith in Christ alone. As peace with God is possible only through the Prince of Peace. The one who secured that peace by shedding his blood on a cross so that the war could be over and our blood need not be spilled to pay the price for warring against the holy and righteous God who created us. Amen? I pray you all know that certain future in Jesus' name. And I'll pray for us. Let's pray. God, thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus. Thank you for the hope for those who are in Jesus, for all who believe, for all who have your gift of faith. And God, I pray this season that many more, maybe in this room, or maybe somebody that we are fond of that is not yet in this room, 
would receive with joy the gift of faith and become part of your family instead of your enemy. Become, instead of sinner, a saint, a child, a co-inheritor with your son, Jesus Christ. And God, for all of us, I would ask, God, let this be our prayer, those assembled here who do know you in this next season. As I pray these words, I pray some will join me. Teach me to rejoice in my suffering. Show me how it is giving me endurance. Grant that my endurance would increase the quality of my character. And may the increase of character increase my assurance of hope and not my pride. In these things we pray. Amen. And before the ushers take the offering, we'll sing a few songs here in just a moment. But as a reflection, I think someone who obviously had that certainty and assurance of faith was the widow in Luke. And Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money in the offering box. Many put in large sums. The poor widow came and put in two small copper coins which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put everything she had all she had to live on. As giving itself is an act of faith. It's an act of confidence in the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. And sometimes I think, I've been learning alongside some other churches recently, sometimes people who don't have what they think is a lot think that giving out of their little doesn't even matter. It, it almost is embarrassing. I'd almost rather give nothing than what feels like an embarrassingly small amount. I was having that conversation with some folks a few weeks ago. And they're like, that's actually typical. That's not, that's not God's heart that we see. That the amount is secondary to heart. Jesus says, yes, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And we see God blesses congregations who give faithfully, whether it's two pennies or whether somebody has a spare half a million, right? If, so for some of us, if we feel like our gifts aren't good enough or even worth giving, no, we, we, should, we should all desire to go from nothing to something. And those who are well off, if it's easy to sort of slice it off without even thinking about it. Well, some need to look at their treasure and go from nothing to something. Some need to look at their heart and go from uncaring ease to actually having the heart of joy and rejoicing in being part of that faith and giving together. Because when a whole body is genuinely engaged in the act of giving, and not, that doesn't just mean buckets and money, that's when God makes congregations flourish. Whether that's numbers, whether that's vivaciousness of spirit. God makes congregations flourish most often when as a team, everyone, the widow or the rich man, is all participating in that together. So I'll pray for us because we have an opportunity. We're going to have an offering as buckets, also an offering of song that Cat will lead us in, and then an offering of lives in the next six days as we finish Sunday and have a week that God's prepared for us. So Father, thank you for the opportunity for our offerings today, for our songs today, for the offering of lips, for the offering of monies, for the offering of the hands that have served and even collected it. And God, we pray those hands and that money and those hearts go out into a week and give in all of the other ways you prepared in advance for us to walk in. In your name, as one body. Amen.